welcome to the For Fun of Knit podcast. My name is Linda and I'm coming to you from South Surrey, just outside of Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada. If this is your first time checking in on the channel, welcome, hope you enjoy. And for those of you that are returning and know what this is all about, <laughs> so happy to see you again and happy to be sharing all of my adventures and misadventures from the last couple of weeks of knitting. So, Without further ado, grab whatever makes you comfy, whether it's coffee or a drink, whatever time zone you're in, grab your knitting and let's do a little bit of knitting chatter. Okay, so the knitting chatter today is gonna start with, I'm gonna do the knitting part. So for those of you that love the knitting, we'll do that first and then we'll do the chatter chatter part at the end. But there's lots to update you on in the chatter. So, and it is knitting related, so you might wanna stick around for that. I have an FO, no big surprise, it's hanging right there. I have a lot of whips. I'm not going through all the whips, but oh my goodness, did I go down a cast on rabbit hole. So <laughs> I wanna share all of that with you. I wanna share some of the processes that I've adopted, um, some new yarn that I'm exploring, and all the good, good things. So here we go. Let's start with just a quick, not a review, but I want to touch on two points from episode 34. First and foremost, thank you for all the wonderful comments. Oh my God, you guys, fabulous. And thank you for all the tips. At some point, I think when I get myself organized, I want to go through all of the comments on all of my videos because some of you have left some amazing, helpful tips that while you've directed them to me, I think everybody would benefit from. So it is my goal to go through all the comments at some point and catalog them and share them. So that might be in an upcoming episode. But the tips in the last episode, the comments were specifically directed around uh, the Donegal, the Olan Donegal DK that I'm using for my Mano sweater from Isabel Kramer. The dark renegade color is actually giving off black dye. Now, before I got all your wonderful comments and your <laughs> helpful tips, I did rewash it and a lot of the color came, or, or the, the color didn't change the yarn, but a lot of the dye, excess dye came out, which was great. I don't think it's all out. I'm still getting a little bit of black on my hands when I knit for, for quite a while, um, but I think I've, I've rinsed out most of it. In future, however, if I have a dark yarn or a super bright, colorful yarn that is um, indie dyed, I will probably wash it, especially if I'm doing color work with a lighter color uh, because, and I will rinse it with vinegar. Yes, yes, yes. I will add vinegar to the water to help it set. So thank you. Several of you made that comment and I greatly appreciate it because it never even occurred to me. So I've heard of that before, but it didn't really relate it to, to yarn. So. Perfect. Thank you very much. The other comment was really about something I said about sweater 14, which I'll probably cover off, but just in case I want to say it here before I forget, I think when I was talking about sweater 14 and as my, one of my next cast ons or, an, or a dream knit, uh, I, I called it size inclusive and I've since been corrected. It's not a hundred percent size inclusive. It's not size inclusive. Apparently size inclusive goes beyond a 55 bust line. It goes more into the 70s, 70 inches. So my apologies for that. Wasn't really um, aware that there was specific parameters around size inclusivity. So now I know, and that is good. And so if you are looking for size inclusive patterns, you're going to look beyond that sweater because that sweater only goes to a 55 inch bust line. That said, let's talk about knitting because I've got lots of wonderful stuff to share with you today. So first and foremost, let's talk about the finished object. It's not a biggie. You've seen it. I was knitting it the last time. I was on a mission to finish off all my Christmas yarns, uh, all the ends and the you know bits and bobs that I had for my Christmas knitting. And I knit mittens in this woolly cauldron green, which was called uh, Santa's Summer Sangria. And the cream is just a mixture of cream leftovers. And then the pink is also just pink minis. So these were all yarns that I used for knitting over Christmas. I knit some mitts in this. I knit a hat in this. Um, 
the Cozumia, is, I think it's called the Cozumia beanie. I always get that wrong, but whatever that, <laughs> whatever that hat is called. But now I have a full set. So I have the shawl. This is the Zara shawl. A mm, little bit of modifications on my part. Sorry, a cloud just came over my beautiful sunshine. Um, but this is the Zara shawl and this is, and I'll try and put a picture up uh, somewhere. But I modified it just in terms of, I put eyelets in it. See, it's got eyelets and stripes. I did two things different. I added a whole bunch of eyelets where there were none. And then I did not do the chevron border. I didn't have enough yarn for that. Um, as well as I was kind of chevron pooped out because of the twist and turns. So I just did a simple an eyelets on the bottom and then I just bound off in the hot pink. So that is a Zara shawl. That is my last uh, charity knit from my Christmas knitting. So there it is and uh, not overly exciting, but it worked and I accomplished my goal. So I'm happy. Sorry, this is not going to look right, is it? Because I am not doing this. I'm not doing that. I'm looking backwards. Good enough. Good enough. Okay, so let's talk about works in progress. Oh, I've got quite a few. I've got a quite a few. Now, I have a lot of works in progress, actually, but I'm not going to go through all of them because I'm just going to focus on the ones that um, have captured my attention at the moment. And before I actually review the whips, I just want to show you a little bit about my process because one of my intentions for 2023 was to create better structure and have better knitting processes or in practices. So I have been trying to be very diligent. All of my current works in progress I keep in this binder and I've shown this before. And this is just a binder and it has, I'm still, I still like paper. I don't know what. I, I'm actually, I have one foot in technology and one foot in paper. So I like to have the paper backup. So I have all the patterns. These are all my current, <laughs> Yes, these are all my current works in progress. So I have a few. And I like to refer to them every now and then, depending on where I am in the house. So this binder is very handy. I have all my works in progress there. Then my sweaters, I have cataloged in this journal. And I love this journal. And I will go through it with you when I'm talking about individual sweaters. But this is kind of what it looks like. I've showed this to you before, and this is what I do. This is a, a, a um, sweater that I did last year, the Duchesne. Duchesne. And I do a little bit of the yarn. I look at the photo, I cut out a piece of the photo, and then it has, it asks you all the pertinent questions about your knitting. Like what yarn are you using? Um, what needles are you using? What notions might you be using? It's behind this picture. What, are the, what is the measurement or the size that you're knitting and what is your gauge? And then you get one, you get three, two, three full pages to write notes and journal your knitting experience. I love this. This has been so good. Um, I just can't, it doesn't have to be this journal, but if you keep a knitting journal, oh my God, I just, I'm absolutely loving it and it's really I don't know it's connecting me more to each project so I'm absolutely loving that and I am going to refer to that as we go through the works in progress so I just want to show you those two things um, and then I've got a new thing to show you for my last whip that is also about process so without further ado let's talk about the first one which is tin can knits the flax this one I've showed you before, obviously, but I've made some progress. And what I love about this one in particular is this garter, um, this garter band. I have to figure out where I am here. This garter band that goes down the sleeves. So it is a very, um, very, very, you know, sorry, it's a very, I'm going to say, generic sweater pattern. You know, it looks like it would go with anything. Very wearable. Another intention for this year. Very wearable. But it just has a detail that makes it a little bit more fun. So, I have cut... Oops, where's my thing? I have cut out the yarns. Now, these are the Noro yarns. Oops, and I just pulled one out. These are the Noro yarns that I'm using. I'm using all scrap Noro yarns that I picked up off of Marketplace. 
and because somebody was selling all of their remnants that they had. And I started with all the rainbow colors and it's Noro Silk Garden that I'm using in solos and some of the colors. So I used all of the colorful ones first and now all I have left is a little bit of the blues and greens, grays and the golds, but look at it so far. Oh my goodness. I absolutely love how this is turning out and I highly recommend it, highly recommend it. This is Noro Solo. So this Solo is the um, Silk Garden Solo is when you have the solid color, but then they also have different colorways where it has its own fade into different colors and it comes in all, all colors. So all these rainbow colors, greens, blues, reds, whatever color palette that you're sort of going for. It is a thick and thin kind of a wool. It is loosely, loosely plied. So there's only two plies, I believe, and it's very loose. Is it loosely plied or is it? Hang on. Is it plied or is it solo? No, it's plied. It's got two different, it's got two different strands in it. So it's a very loose two ply from what I can see. Correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody knows differently. Um, but I just arbitrarily striped them. The gold is all the single ones and some of the green is the single ones and I have reds that are singles. So I did all the color in the body and then I did the ribbing in the gold which I absolutely love. And now I'm on to the sleeves. And so the sleeves are gonna be less colorful because I don't have any more of the purples and the pinks and the aquas. So I think I'm gonna do a little bit of color, do some blue, work into greens, and then finish off in the gold. So the last, you know, probably from about the elbow down will be in the gold color. And if you'll notice, look at those lines. Yup, that's exactly what you think they are. They're for sticking. So part of my intention is to learn new skills this year. So the sticking is what I'm gonna be doing with this particular sweater. And so I am going to film that with you guys so that we can do it together. Um, probably not live, cause it's far too uh, nerve wracking, but I don't I really don't know what I'm doing, especially when it came to the ribbing. I really didn't want to, I think what I should have done is just done the ribbing back and forth and left a gap. But I decided no to continue the steak section all the way down and when it comes to it, I'm just gonna fold it back. So I might have a lumpy bumpy thing at the end here, not too sure. But I wasn't too sure. I didn't watch any videos, that was dumb. But anyway, hey, Adventures and misadventures, so there you go. Anyway, I am looking forward to this cardigan being done. It's gonna be just lovely. And then you have to pick back up. This is a, this was a cast on. You have to pick up from the cast on edge and knit the neck. And I like that because that gives you the fit that you want around the neck in terms of how tight or how loose. So really loving this. Again, this is um, the flax from Tin Can Knits. Okay, so that is whip number one. Is there anything that I need to tell you about the flax? So I've got all my current whips labeled, so I can just flip to the flax, flip to the flax, there you go. Um, and did I do anything different? My gauge is, my row gauge, my stitch gauge is correct, my row gauge is tight. So I'm gonna have to, I knit mine a little bit longer than the pattern called for because the row gauge was 22 rows per four inches and I got 27. So again, if you get more rows or stitches than the pattern says, that means you're knitting tighter. So your garment is going to be smaller. I always have to remind myself of that. Um, and so I'm using the option of, or the size 42 so my width, my stitch count is perfect. It's my row gauge, my length that is wrong. So that will play into um, the yoke, making sure the yoke is deep enough. So you might have to, I had to add a couple of rows before I split for the sleeves, more than the pattern called for to make sure my yoke was deep enough. And then when it came to the body, 
well, most time you just knit it as long as you want it. But if you are following the pattern to a T, it again means you'd have to add more rows to get the right length because you're knitting a bit tighter. Um, I'm knitting the large size, 44 inch, so I want a little bit of ease in mine and I am using the suggested needle. So really, I have done very few modifications on that sweater. And see, this is why I love this particular book, because it keeps me completely on track. Anyway, so I have been loving that knit. And so my attention is divided between knitting that and knitting the next love that I have in terms of knitting which is, you guessed it, dun, 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 where is it? Sweater number 14 from, is this My Favorite Things? Yes, My Favorite Things, sweater number 14. I just loved the relaxed look of this, but the sophistication of the yarns that are used. Now, I was thinking that a little bit ambitiously that I would join uh, Casey Apple from the Young Folks Bougie Sweatshirt Knit Along. I do too many projects at a time to actually be able to finish anything in the time frame for a knit along, so I'm just not even going to go there. That is just not something that works for me, but I still wanted a boozy sweatshirt type of um, sweater. And so I did show some options in the last episode, whether I'd go gray or blue, and I chose going with the blue. So I am using uh, Anzula Dreamy in the blueberry colorway. And this is, which I just absolutely love this color, is 75% superwash merino, 15% cashmere, 10% silk. So a lovely super soft yarn and then I have paired it um, with the navy mohair from Knitting with Olive. Now this mohair I started using it very very recently. I have traditionally and by traditionally I haven't used a lot of mohair but the mohair that I first used and spoiled me was Shibui's um, Silk Cloud Mohair, which now Shibui has gone out of business. They've decided to close their doors, so there's still some Shibui left in some stores, but I switched to Knitting for Olive. And now Shibui, I do believe, gives you 333 yards per skein. This gives, Knitting for Olive gives you 225. Is that right? Or 250. What does it give you here? Knitting for Olive gives you slightly less yard yardage, but a significantly, or not significant, but also a lesser uh, price. So I think it's 250 yards. Um, and literally it works out to be about two or three cents a foot cheaper for the Olive, um, Knitting for Olive. And this is 70% mohair, 30% silk, super soft. Super, I can't tell the difference between the Shibui and the um, Knitting for Olive, other than the Knitting for Olive seems to be a little bit fluffier. It has a little bit more hair to it. So love it, love it, love it. And this is what I paired it with, because again, I was look, I want something wearable. And yet, dress it up, dress it down. So this is what has, so far, it's a work in progress. Look at the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, I absolutely love it. And I noticed like this is all one, believe it or not, this is all one skein all the way down here, but the skein faded in the middle. And I don't mind, it's indie dyed yarn. You know what, that is the beauty to me. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In this particular sweater, because you get that lighter pooling throughout the sweater and in different spots, I don't think it matters at all. And in the back, see, same sort of idea. It's a bit of a stripe, but it doesn't offend me at all. As a matter of fact, I just, I just love it because it's supposed to be a sweatshirty kind of thing. So, um, this, I have obviously, I loved the construction of this. This is totally different for me. Um, 
having to pick up from the shoulders. So you do the back to a certain length without giving too much away because this is a paid for pattern. Then you work the front panels independently from each shoulder and then you join them and then you knit in the round to, for the rest of the body. Then technically you're supposed to go back and do the neck. Because I've never done a v-neck, I've never done a v-neck before and I've never done ribbing on a v-neck and I've never created this beautiful, get this hair, this one, this beautiful, beautiful detail here. I've never done this kind of a join before. It was bugging me. It was in the back of my head that, can I do this? How, you know, how difficult is this? Is this going to be, am I going to get through the whole sweater, you know, sleeves and everything and the ribbing and then I'm going to get to the neck and I'm going to ruin the sweater? So I decided to do the sweater, or the neckline first. <laughs> and I'm glad I did because I had to do it twice. I had to do it twice and I'll look, refer to my journal and tell you why. But the finished, the second time around, absolutely gorgeous. I think anyway, it's just my personal view. And I used an Italian bind off. The pattern is actually asking you to knit this section and then knit it double and then fold it over and sew it together so you have a double um, neckline. And that is absolutely in the photo, a double neckline. But mine was so thick, like I don't know, just because I guess not all fingering weight yarns are the same. And this is, I do believe, a four ply. Um, maybe it's only a two ply. This is only a two ply, but it's very, very um, fluffy or bouncy. And so this is the thickness. I mean, my collar would have been, you know, that thick. So for me, I just thought, ooh, that's a little, I wasn't too sure about that. I kind of chickened out. So I thought I will just do it one way and then I'll do an Italian bind off. Why an Italian bind off? I've never done it. So yay me, new technique new techniquing all over the place. I'm trying to live, live my nine intentions. So new technique and it's supposed to be quite stretchy and it is, but it doesn't gape, which is lovely. So I'm so happy with how that turned out. Is it perfect? Nope. Does anybody know? No one but me, but I absolutely love it. And what I will say, and I will recommend, and this wasn't my recommendation, this was, I do believe, Noreen's recommendation and Jackie from my knitting group. They actually recommended that you do the neck. Um, and one of the reasons, before you finish the sweater, and then one of the reasons is that this neckline pulls the sweater in. And so if you're trying to determine how long you want your the body of the sweater to be, you're better off doing the neck and making sure that it's finished so that it's hanging correctly on your body um, versus sagging open here, perhaps creating a little, perhaps creating a little bit more length in the body um, artificially. And then as soon as you add the neck, it sort of draws it back in and it might potentially lift the length of the body up a bit. So I thought that was very sage advice. So that's what I did. And now I am working my way uh, on, I'm, I just have to do a couple more inches of the bo body and then I'm gonna do the ribbing, which is a split hem, awesome. And then the sleeves are quite deep. So, oh, and just the fabric, look, okay. Look at this fabric. I am loving, I, I could sleep on this, honestly. You could go camping and sleep on this. I don't know who wears mo silk mohair to go camping, but I think I could go camping and I could sleep on this. So, absolutely love it. So let me tell you a little bit more about this particular, and I've got it in my, hi Ingrid, if you're watching, my Sunny Designs uh, project bag, it's still Christmassy, but I just love it, and I love, it was really this blue, the Dutch blue. Um, did I tell everybody that I'm going to Holland in September? I don't think I did, that's part of chatter. Okay, anyway, the Dutch blue kind of went with my sweater, so I kept it. So Sunny Designs is the project bag maker for that one. And then if I go to, because I've got my tabs on top, and I go to sweater number 14. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but that says sweater number 14A. There's a reason it says A. <laughs> so 
So anyway, so again, I love this. I just put some of the fiber there that I'm working with. I put a picture of the yarn. I kind of mix it up as to where I'm putting it in the book. And then I write all the details down. And what I always put down is what are, what does the pattern say the needle should be and the gauge should be and the size that you should do and then what I actually chose to do. So for example, in this particular one, the needle size was recommended to be a seven millimeter needle and then a six millimeter for, I do believe that's correct. I hope I'm not misquoting that, but I know for sure the body was to be knit in a seven millimeter. I didn't like the fabric, it was too open. So I used a six millimeter. Um, for the ribbing, I'm using a five and a half. Now, the gauge was supposed to be 16 stitches in four inches and 21 rows in four inches. I did not block this. I did not do a swatch. I didn't do a swatch. But lucky me, pre-blocked, which is not an accurate gauge, okay, but pre-blocked, I got, whew, I'm using the smaller needles. Now I'm, I'm just mohair. Um, so using the smaller needles, I got 16 inches to uh, 16 sh stitches to four inches and 22 rows. So I'm just one row more. So it might be a little bit. Oh, pardon me. I'm a little bit shorter. So I got one row more. I'm a little bit shorter. Now, if you're supposed to knit the body 20 inches, that means you've got five four inch segments which means if I am one row short every time, I should technically have to knit five more rows to get the right length, in addition to what the pattern recommends. So um, it'll be interesting when I swatch this to see what gauge I've got, because I'm almost bang on gauge pre-blocked. It'll be interesting to see what happens post-blocking. Now, this particular sweater, because I've never knit it before, I did make a few mistakes, and so I wanted to go back and I fixed them. So it does call for using fingering weight and two mohair, and that's what I did. Um, let's take a look. The neck band I wrote here was a bit finicky picking up um, the stitches in terms of the right number. They ask you for a certain number down one front, a certain number down the middle. You've got two little stitches here, and you've got to kind of add, you know, pick up stitches to make sure that your V is gonna be correct. That was a little bit finicky. And so I didn't get the right number of stitches. I got too many on both sides. I got a lot more on this side for some reason, I don't know. Uh, and then I got too many across the neck. And so I just knit one round where I fixed all of that. So I knit together where I needed to knit together and I evenly spaced it. So, and then I started on the neck instructions. But I didn't, you, I didn't follow their well, let's put it this way. When you're putting markers on the neckline, because you've got to mark each shoulder, the beginning of your row, the V and the neck, and I used all the same stitch markers, colors, and I got confused and I started treating the, um, what do I have on my sweater? Oh, I've got a stain on my sweater. That's not good. Terribly sorry, stain on my sweater. Um, I started using the V here as my shoulder. And so it was looking really odd and awkward for a, a, quite a while until I figured, like I almost got to the very end. I had to rip the whole neckline out and redo it. Um, and then I decided not to, so when I did it again the second time, I really loved the look of it. And then I did the Italian bind off. So that worked out well. Now it's in a bit of a hiatus because I got all the way down the body and I realized I was making a lot of mistakes. So I got down to, I don't know how many inches, but I realized I was using the wrong needle size. I said I was gonna use five and a half and I pared down to five. And so everything was starting to pull in and I'm going, ooh, I don't like this. Um, that was one thing I did wrong. I didn't understand when I read the instructions for what's called an EST um, on e each edge, on each edge, 
when you're doing the ribbing, you know, to, to create a nice finish on each edge, she's got a very specific process. I kept, I read it over and over and over again. It's so simple. It's so brutally simple, but I made it really complicated in my head. So I kept doing it wrong. And thank you to my lovely ladies at my knitting group who set me straight on that one because I just had a roadblock. I kept, you know, looking at it in a certain way and it wasn't gonna change. But I was definitely wrong. Um, so I had to undo that part. So this is all the reasons why I couldn't continue. I also, it says measure, it says measure from the center back cast on edge to determine the length of the body. Clear as day instructions. And what do I do? I measure from the shoulder. Way back here, way back here. So I'm thinking I've got lots, I'm way ahead. Cause the shoulders drop at the back. The shoulders are actually, you know, off, off your back and they're about here, the shoulder seam. And I'm measuring from here and I'm going, oh, all the way down here. To, yeah, I've got my 20 inches. No, you're supposed to measure from the center back, which is a shorter length. <laughs> so I made so many errors on that. So then I had to pull it all out. So it's been sitting in a hiatus for about four or five days, but now I'm ready to pick it up. After this video, I'm gonna pick it right back up and finish those extra, extra length that I need. And then now that I know how to do the edging, I'm going to do that properly. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, moral of the story, pay attention to the details in the pattern, Linda. <laughs> For some reason, I wasn't paying attention to the details on that pattern. However, I loved doing this so much and I had so much fun and I'm going to have to pause and get rid of that stain because that's bothering me. So I apologize, but before I pause and see what I can do about that stain is I started sweater number 14B. <laughs> so this is sweater 14B, number 14B. And this is just a scrappy sweater. So this was again, all in the theme of a bougie sweatshirt, you know, kind of idea. And I have gotten, I've done the back. I didn't do it as long as the pattern recommended because I'm striping it. Adding a whole level of complexity to a pattern that you don't know, try striping it, just start striping it. And then you don't know what you're running into because here's the thing. I decided I was going to stripe it. Not a problem. These shoulders are dropped and on an angle at the back. This is how it sits on your back shoulder. Here's the top of your shoulder. That is the idea. So it is angled from the center neck to your arm, to your shoulder. So just behind here, it's going to start here and it's going to come up. Because of that angle, trying to figure out where the stripe is going to fall to make sure the stripe is in the same spot. I completely, I hope you can see that, see how the shoulder seam is on an angle. I completely guessed. I have no idea if this is going to line up. And then when I pick up, think about this, then when I pick up for the sleeves, I'm going to have to do intarsia to get this stripe. Am I going to have to do intarsia? I've never done it. Am I, is that, if I want this stripe to go around, I'm going to knit in one color, knit in a second color, go back to the first color, come around, knit. I'm going to have to learn intarsia. It's either that or I color block it and I say, for you know, stripe the front and back, great, but then the sleeves are going to be a totally different color. And that might not be bad. That might not be bad. I might end up doing that. I mean, learning intarsia might be a little bit too much for me at this stage. Um, I have no idea, but I just thought, wow. So yeah, so I started striping it and look at the pink and I'm gonna stripe the whole body and the whole front. Sleeves might be color blocked. Neck band is probably gonna be a totally different color. So I might just do all my scraps, different colors, and I'm even combining the creams because I don't have a lot of this color. I only had one skein 
of this, and this is Hedgehog Fibers Silence, Skinny Single Silence. In my D stash, I sold the other three skeins because this was actually not even quite a full skein. So I sold three full skeins of this yarn, and then I decided, oh, I'll just do a scrappy project. So I have no idea what color this is going to end up being, but I love the sweater so much. I love the knit so much. I think it's going to be so wearable with jeans, you know, loose fitting dresses, um, over leggings. It's, it's beautiful. So that is sweater number 14. And the, the mohair, of course, is knitting with olive in the uh, ecru color, in the off-white, pardon me, it's called off-white. So that is dun, 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 what I'm going to do. My next, so my stripes, if you can see my stripes, one of my stripes, and I'm holding it together with the mohair, the green is just, uh, I think it's a Madeline Tosh uh, Merino single, and this is one of the remnants from Life in the Long Grass from my Twists and Turns shawl, which is lovely. I have so many beautiful scraps, like look at this one with all the different colors in it, and it can even, I can then incorporate teal, like I can color block. I just love that idea with the mohair. Oh, the options are endless when you are doing a scrappy project. So this is why none of them are getting done because I'm just flipping from one to the other to the other. And it's just, oh, it's just my happy place. I just, I'm loving it so much. I hope I'm not overwhelming the rest of you, but I'm just loving it so much. And then, so that is whip number three. Whip number four is a brand new cast on whip. So this is the cast on itis. So I had the flax on the needles, as you know. I also had the crisscross from Isabel Kramer. I haven't knit on that. And I have the Mano from Isabel Kramer. I haven't knit on that. Those are hot in my head and my heart. I want to get to those. But where I'm focused right now is on the fun sort of potato chippy knit of these ones. And then, Noreen, this is all your fault from my knitting group, told me that Linda, that Coco Knits is having a knit along. It's called the Everlasting Cow, I do believe. And they are using the Coco Knits process of making a sweater and it is the Mabel sweater. So, and she's like, do you want to do that? Actually, no, she didn't say, do you want to? She said, I'm doing that. And I thought, oh, well, if you're doing it, well then, heck, I might as well do it enabler. <laughs> so I happen to have in my library the Coco Knits book. So her, uh, so Julie Weisberger, is it what? Uh, Weisenberger? Julie Weisenberger is the author and she is the designer and the creator of this uh, process. And the process itself is how to knit a very fitted, and by fitted I don't mean close to the body, I mean a sweater that fits your shoulder and yoke area customized to you. And she has a very specific shoulder seam design and then a process for knitting the yoke that is very, very unique, very specific, but very adaptable for all body types, all pattern types. Um, and basically this is a recipe that you can then build off of for all of your sweater knitting. So this is her book and I bought this and I never picked, I never read it. I've had it for two or three years and I never went and it comes with all the worksheets, uh, another workbook with all the worksheets. And I think I bought this from a Spas Tricot back in like 20, 2020. And because we started this joining this cow, I don't, now that I think about it, I don't think I formally joined. I don't think I formally joined. I'll have to, but I am doing it obviously, so I'll have to try and go on Ravelry and join. <laughs> Typical me. Um, but needless to say, uh, because we joined that, the Everlasting Cal with a Julie Weisenberger, Coco Knits, I read the book. Wow. Well, first of all, it has like six, six patterns in here that are fully adaptable, plus it's got her process. And then she gives, this workbook has extra worksheets in it. Now the pattern that we're knitting is not in this book. The pattern is called the Mabel sweater. And do I have a picture of the Mabel sweater? Do I have a picture of the Mabel sweater? Yes, I do somewhere. Here it is. It's not the best picture, so I'll try and show you another one. But 
This is the Ma Mabel sweater. This is the Mabel sweater. And again, um, very, very basic. This is more a knit along to learn the process and how you can adapt it. And she gives you lots of different options for adapting the pattern. Very standard sweatshirty kind of a kind of a pattern, which I like. It's called the Mabel, or it's called Mabel. And I have chosen to do Mabel. Where is Mabel? Mabel is here. Using where is my did I not? Oh my god, I did. Using I'm trying to find my oh well using Malabrigo Mecha, M-E-C-H-A. This is a bulky weight yarn. It calls for a bulky weight yarn. This is single ply in the English rose colorway. Now, I happen to have, and I had put this in my D stash, I laugh. I had half of the skeins from one dye lot and half of the skeins from another dye lot. So I just love these colors, just absolutely love these colors. I pulled them out of my D stash and I decided, dang it, I'm going to knit with it. So I love these colors. That's the yarn that I'm using. And he, I did swatch. You'd be so proud of me. I swatched. I swatched. Look at how lovely that looks. Now that is just with one of the color, way, color um, dye lots. That's not both of them. That is the pinkier of the two. The You'll see, I don't have it with me, but you'll see the third one, the other dye lot uh, in the actual sweater itself. So here it is. Here is Mabel to date. So this is so much fun. She compartmentalizes how she knits things. So you start, and I'm not going to give it away because it's paid for a pattern, but you start knitting a bit of the back using some sort of, you know, increases, etc., to get the right shape. And then you pick up stitches in a very unique way and you knit a shoulder cap, like a little front piece. And then you join everything, not in the round yet, but you come around the shoulder and you start increasing, knit a bit, increasing for the sleeves, knit across the back, come around to the other side, and then you're knitting it flat. So you're going back and forth. You're going from around to around and around, back again, um, as you create the top of the sweater and the edging of the circular neckline because it's a crew neckline and you can make it a turtleneck you can make it a crew neck you can do all sorts of things with it now just a quick comment about the yarn you can see the top part here is quite light and pink with a little bit more white or lighter very very soft pink in it and then when you get down here now i am doing helical knitting i have incorporated the other skeins and so you can see that there's a stripe again, a little darker. I don't mind. That's the love for me of indie dyed yarn. It looks like a fade. So the rest of the sweater is going to look like this. It's only in this top part that was knit front and back. I couldn't figure out how to um, use both yarns. It was very complicated because I'm learning a new process for increasing, a new process for... Um, the whole sweater basically and then to now have to stripe it I'd end up striping it and I thought eh what's the difference fade stripe very very similar so I opted just to go with the one yarn color or dye lot and now I am helical knitting both and yeah so it's coming out absolutely gorgeous I love the colors and I've tried it on I'm now at the point where then eventually you Eventually, they're short, they're short rows that create this part of the neckline, and then you join, and then you knit in the round, and she gives you increases and decreases for the front, the, sh the sleeves, and for the back, and it creates just these beautiful lines, like these beautiful, it's hard to see when it's a variegated yarn, but you get a beautiful seam line. Maybe it's easier to see in the front. Can you see that ridge? You get a beautiful seam line all the way down. 
and it's just a very structured look and it's very it's it's, it's very professional I have to say it's a very professional finish to me and now I'm at the point where I have to separate for the sleeves so let's talk a little bit about what I did with this sweater. Now this sweater is sitting in the Woolen Frogs. Um, I think it's the Woolen Frog, yeah. The Woolen Frog, which they have an Etsy shop. I think her name is Carol. And I love this bag. It is my rooster's bag, roosters and chicks. I absolutely love it. So that is Mabel. So let's just go into here and see what I have written for Mabel because there are some details. So Mabel, you can see I have I have put the yarn there and there's, oh, there's probably a better picture. Can you see that? Can you see the picture of Mabel? There you go, that's the model Mabel for the Mabel. Um, and so what did I say here? I said um, the pattern called for again seven millimeter needles. I opted for six and a half. Again, I got, this is for the body. I got the right gauge so when I swatched. So I swatched it. So my lovely little swatch shows me that on that needle size, I got the right gauge stitch wise. However, I am four rows, is that correct? Four rows shorter. So interesting like that I get the width of the stitch, but I don't get the height of the stitch with a smaller needle. So that means that my overall garment is going to be shorter. So that means again in the yoke, I have to knit it a little bit longer um, in order to get the right depth. So again, when you're knitting a top down sweater, it's really easy to follow the pattern and then try it on and adjust. If you have to adjust, do a few more increases or maybe it's wide enough you don't need to do any more increases but you need to add some depth so you can just add a few more rows um, which is what I will be doing I did do helical knitting what else did I say oh <laughs> one of the wonderful things about this Coco Knits design process is that you have to do a little bit of charting on your own to start you have to fill out a worksheet and this is a yoke worksheet. I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is a work yoke sheet. A, pardon, a work yoke sheet. A yoke worksheet. <laughs> and it gives you all the headings on the top and they are um, right sleeve, right front, right sleeve, back, left sleeve, left front. And you basically on each line of your yoke, based on what the pattern tells you, you write in each section where you're going to increase. And I'm not gonna give the whole process away, but it's a, it's a very methodical process and the worksheet lays it all out for you. So you know exactly row by row, whether you're increasing on the, the, the sleeve, sleeve only, the front only, the sleeve in the front, the front in the back, everything. So it doesn't matter what your increases are, you plot them all in and then you can't go wrong. That's the theory. So it was fun doing the worksheet. I really enjoyed doing it because it really made me pay attention to what was happening in the pattern. And then I started knitting and I was in a groove. It was so cool. And then I stopped looking at the worksheet and I just kept going. Well, guess what? I missed completely two sets of increases in the front and the back because several rows down, um, you're not just increasing in the sleeves, you then start to increase in the fronts and the backs as well. And I missed. You would think I would, you know, tink it back and, and go backwards. And I'm like, no, no, we're not gonna tink it back. That's four or five rows of tinking and I don't wanna do that. So I'm just gonna continue on, try it on. And if I have to do more increases at the bottom, I'll do that. Turns out I didn't have to do that. It fits perfectly, not even blocked yet. And it's super washed, so it's gonna grow a bit, but it fits perfectly with just the way I'm doing it. So that made me think, why does it fit perfectly? I've missed two full sets of increases, so that's a few stitches I don't have. Why is it fitting properly? And that's because um, my stitch count at the very beginning was wrong. <laughs> my stitch count at the very beginning 
was a few too many stitches in between two sizes. Like I cast on more than one size, but not enough for the, for the next size. And for whatever reason, I have no idea. Uh, then I decided, well, maybe I should check my gauge too and see, you know, am I knitting? Because this is a combin, this is, am I knitting a com, this is a combination of, you know, knitting flat front going, you know, front to back, front to back, front to back, and then knitting in the round. Is my gauge any different? So what happened? What was I getting? It was supposed to be 12 stitches to four inches. I was getting 15 once I started knitting the actual garment. Different than my swatch. And uh, you were supposed to be getting 18 rows per four inches. Originally my swatch was 22 rows, but my actual knitting is only 20. I don't get it. So moral of this story is I am enjoying swatching and I do think swatching is helpful. But moral of the story is when you have started knitting and you've knit a little bit, check your gauge again. <laughs> I don't know. I think maybe just the mood you're in, where you're knitting, if your arms are on a, you know, on a table knitting, because sometimes, you know, we're at a cafe and I'm knitting or whether they're beside me or out on an armchair. I think your, I think your tension changes. I'm going to say there's no consistency there. Not for me anyway. So the moral of this story is that I have to be very careful with what I'm doing. I'm absolutely loving it. I am loving the Coco Knits process. So thrilled. And again, all my intentions, new construction. Yay. This totally meets the new, new construction piece, new skills, loving it, uh, learning lots and, uh, can't say enough about it. Can't say enough about it. So not everybody is going to buy their own version, but I do believe these books are available in your library because one of uh, one of my knitting buddies has bought it from the library. So check your library. You don't have to um, spend money on the actual book. Um, if you're local, I'm happy to lend you them. Um, if you're local to me and you can't, can't buy them or don't want to buy them, by all means, I'm happy to lend them to somebody local. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to mail them. Just letting you know, but I'm happy to share. I'm happy to share, but this is fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Thoroughly enjoying it. Okay. So those are my works in progress. I do have a couple of socks on the go, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today because we'll be here forever. But one of the fun things, um, okay. Before I get into the fun things, actually, before I get into the fun things, let me have a sip of coffee. <laughs> Am I talking a lot? I think I am. And my light changed because the clouds are coming. It's going to snow again. Just letting you know. So I'm just going to put that there. Felt that in there. There you go. Now you can't see the stain. There we go. Don't ask me what I ate that I spilled. Can't take me anywhere. You can dress me up. You just can't take me. Look at that. You can use. I gleaned. <laughs> I cleaned the sweater. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing the turtle dove. You know this, I've worn it a million times. This is my sweatshirt at the moment. Um, made out of Drops Air. Turtle Dove is a free pattern by Espace Tricot. I would not use this yarn for exactly this reason. I just gleaned it again for the 12th millionth time today and all of that came off. Um, but yeah, that's a different story. Needless to say, love the pattern. I'm definitely gonna knit it again. Um, so let's go into not one of my intentions, one of my nine intentions was to um, get some specialty yarns. Well, I think I'm broadening that a little bit in that I want to try different yarns, yarns that I don't really know much about. And so I joined um, a yarn club for the year from Sweet Paprika. And Sweet Paprika... Uh, where did I put my, I'm going to put all of this down. Hang on a second. Oops, don't wreck your book. Sweet Paprika is uh, Debbie and Elizabeth, and they're out of Montreal, and they have, um, they are yarn dyers, and they have partnered with different uh, yarn makers and uh, woolen mills and wool makers, wool providers, to create a yarn club where it's called Beyond Sweet Paprika 
Beyond Merino. Can you see that? I don't know if you can see that. Beyond Merino Yarn Club. Mm, I don't know if that's showing the right way. The Sweet Paprika Beyond Merino Yarn Club. And so six times a year, you will get a couple skeins of a totally different breed. And this particular, the very first box that we received was from the Small Bird Workshop which, believe it or not, is local to me in the sense that it's on Vancouver Island. So it's Catherine uh, outside of, I do believe, I think she is in Courtney, in between Courtney and Campbell River. Uh, her mailing address is Nanaimo, but the Small Bird, Bird Workshop provided Sweet Paprika with this beautiful 100% Coradale DK weight yarn. And then this is natural in the natural gray and this is dyed by sweet paprika in the color lagoon and what's fun about this yarn club and i think you can still join i'm not too sure what's fun about this yarn club is that it includes zoom meetings and the zoom meetings are educational about the yarn breed and so catherine was telling us all about Coradale fiber and how it knits up and how it's sustainable and and just oh all sorts of wonderful information about the Coradale sheep and fabulous absolutely fabulous and so I'm saving this first of all I love this color combination this tealy blue along with the gray and so when I do knit it it's going to be something very special but I I'm just collecting it at the moment <laughs> It's just going to sit there because I absolutely love it and I don't know what to make with it yet. So I want it to be something special. So that is what I'm doing with that. So that is, again, uh, exploring new yarns and new dyes. Now, Sweet Paprika is not a new dyer to me. If you look at my D-Stash page, I do have some Sweet Paprika available. I've kept a lot of my Sweet Paprika. Um, but all in superwash merino and so this is non superwash which is really what I wanted to explore uh, with them so love 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 this acquisition okay so that's that let's that is it for the knitting believe it or not that is it for the knitting for tonight today now we're going to talk a little bit about chatter so for those of you that were just here for the knitting and if you're going to head out right now thank you so much have a wonderful few weeks before I see you again and for those of you that are gonna stick around for the chatter, wonderful, wonderful. I've got a few things to share. So, talking about de-stashing. Oh, I don't sell this stuff, guys, but this is the gleaner that I used for this shirt. And I just gleaned the front and one sleeve. Can you see the difference? I don't know if you can see the difference. Uh, who can see the difference? I don't know that you can see the difference. This one's gleaned, this one's not. I don't know that you can see the difference. Maybe, it's hard to tell, but you can. All of this, all of that came off of the sleeve in the front of this sweater. <laughs> so, and this is a great gleaner. Um, actually, it was the grocery girls I was watching. They're the ones who got me into this, this particular one. And it is called, it's actually the Gleaner brand. And it comes with different coarseness of razors to actually take the shedding off your sweater. The one design flaw is that this release button is in the wrong spot for me because I want to hold this gleaner when I'm gleaning. I want to hold it with my thumb on this little scoopy part. You can't do that. It pops off your gleaner every time. So I have to remind myself to tuck my thumb, thumb in and glean it this way without letting my thumb creep to this is a natural thing i think <laughs> but for some reason i keep pushing this button so fyi but it's great it works very very well doesn't require any batteries or anything like that so i would recommend it no i'm not supported by gleaner but i thought i would share because i've got all the gleaning on my sweater but there you go um so as you all know i de-stashed um and for all the right reasons, I do want to show you one. I'm going to put you on pause here because I'm going to grab something. I want to show you a great example of why there are some absolutely beautiful yarns in my D-stash on Ravelry. Um, and mostly it's because of online buying. So hold that thought. I'll be right back. 
Okay, I'm back because I just wanted to show you this. Like I have got quite a few yarns that I put on my Ravelry under D stash. And here's a perfect example. So I was looking for some silk mohair. I'm, I'm, I'm having a silk mohair moment where I want to knit everything with two strands of silk mohair, as long as I can find it more cost effectively. And I found this beautiful, I think you can see that, this beautiful golden color. It's called Caramel. It's Knitting by Olive out of a store in the States. Um, and I purchased it because it goes with some fingering that I've got, some singles that I thought would be perfect for another bougie kind of sweatshirt. This is what I received. So now, this is Caramel. This is caramel. Granted, I think this is actually more of a true caramel color, but this is quite, the top one is quite gold. That's what I was thinking I was getting. This is what I ended up getting. Am I going to return this? No, I love it. I think it's gorgeous, but it's not what I was planning. So this is going into my stash. I'll find something. <laughs> But that is why I have some beautiful, beautiful sweater quantities worth of yarn in my stash because I bought them online and the color online and the color really in person were not the same thing. A couple of examples. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have eight skeins of Barocco Ultra Alpaca Light, which is, hello. 50% fine, super fine alpaca and 50% Peruvian wool. So this is non super wash. This is 146 yards or 133 meters per skein. And I have eight of them, plenty for a sweater in this beautiful. Now this is true to color. This is a, if you're seeing a rusty barnyard red, then that's correct. When I bought it online, it was a blue red, almost like not a Christmas red, but a blue red. Whereas this is barnyard, um, this is a much warmer color. And I love this. I think this, I've got this yarn in a different color in my own stash, but this is not a color I'm going to knit with. I think it's beautiful yarn, but that is an example of what I have in my stash. Another good example of why I have some great yarns in my stash is my local um, knitting group back in 2019 decided to do the Harry Potter scarf. And I thought, okay, well, I'll join. And my yarn, my local yarn shop was, had recommended the yarn for it. And so I bought the kit and it all came. And so I have five skeins of Friday Harbor in the Ecru colorway. And this, I do believe, is a worsted weight. If I'm not mistaken, it's a worsted weight. You can check on Ravelry. But I have five skeins of that, a navy blue skein, and an orange skein. I also have two purple skeins, which I didn't bring. But I have these beautiful skeins of Friday Harbor. Why are they getting destashed? Because this Let's put it this way. They're going to get destashed unless I knit with them first. <laughs> so, but these are more of, they're coming across on the camera for me quite as a light white cream. In fact, they are more of a gray. They have a slight hint of gray. It does not look like a funny flower. A slight hint of gray to the cream. They're not as bright white as what you're seeing here. They're a little creamier. Hope that makes sense. And so it wasn't what I expected. I thought it was going to be like a whitish cream. Not white, not white, white, but quite a nice light off white. And this is much creamier in real life um, with a slight gray, a hint of gray. That is the only reason. I have other beautiful cream yarn. So this was a duplicate in worsted weight. And what's nice about this stuff is, which I, you know, I go back and forth. I put stuff in D-stash and then I think, oh, I don't know whether I really should do that because this is, I do believe, this is 80% merino, 20% silk. That is an interesting blend and I've never knit with it. So for now, it is in my, on my D-stash page in Ravelry. 
Um, but that has been going really well, and I'm going to do round two of my of de-stashing because I still have a lot of DK and worsted weight yarns that are repeats in color for whatever reason. But I know I'm just not I'm not going to get around to knitting with it. I, how many royal blue sweaters do you need? How many cream sweaters do you need? How many you know gray sweaters do you need? So I do have duplicates in color, so that's going to be round two. Just letting you know. So that's what happened with the de-stashing. And then, fun things that happened to me this in the last couple weeks are, um, I think last year, I think I told everybody that I bought a spinning wheel. Well, I did everything backwards. I want to learn to spin, but I did everything backwards. In 2020, in October 2020, Mum and I went to a farm on Barnston Island and met a wonderful lady by the name of Susan who showed us her whole operation. She has a small herd of sheep and she provides fleeces every year. There's a big fleece market here in the Lower Mainland. And she provided, um, she, was, she was recommended to me, to, so I went and I bought a fleece. I don't know how to spin, didn't have a spinning wheel, but I bought a fleece. And so this fleece has been partially cleaned, so it hasn't been washed yet, but it's been, I don't know what they call it. All, this, all the bad stuff has been picked out, but there's still some left. It needs some good cleaning and it still needs to be picked, picked clean. So I bought this fleece and I think I have a pound, like I have a big bag a fleece. And then last year I said for Christmas, okay, not, not this Christmas, but Christmas 2021, I said, oh, I think, I think I want to buy a spinning wheel. So for Christmas, I got a little bit of money and I went to Penelope Fiber Arts and Brenda, you know, helped me choose a spinning wheel. So in May, I think I got a spinning wheel and I bought an Ashford, is it called Ashford? It's an Ashford Kiwi 3. So love it. It's been sitting in the box since May. <laughs> so since May of last year. So it's February 2022, 23. Oh my goodness, it's more than that. I bought it in May of 2022. It's been sitting in the box until February of 2023. And I thought, you know what? I probably really should do something with this. I've got this spinning, I've got this fleece down in my basement. I got my, I've got a, you know, spinning machine, a spinning wheel underneath my desk in a box. Maybe I should look into spinning. So I am a member of the School of Sweet Georgia, which I have learned a lot of wonderful things. And I thought they've got a great online spinning course. But you know what? I'm just online learning fatigued a bit, I think. So I thought, you know, there's got to be a spinning guild or a knitting guild in the Lower Mainland somewhere. And I know that there's the, the Knitters Guild of Vancouver, but I didn't want to drive into the city. I found the Peace Arch Weavers and Spinning, no, Peace Arch Association of Weavers and Spinners. Guess what? They are 15 minutes from me in Cloverdale, which is part of Surrey. It's a suburb of Surrey. And I just thought, okay, last week I'm going to drop in. They have a website. They have meetings according to their website every Wednesday and it's drop in and blah, blah, blah. So I went, oh, ladies. Oh, gentlemen, whoever's watching, all of you, if you have not been, you have to go. This is a group that is so friendly, so welcoming, so amazing, so knowledgeable, so experienced, and yet they welcomed me, who has never spun anything other than a little bit of my drop spindle. And I thought that, I don't know what I, I do not know what I expected, but it was amazing. Super warm, super friendly, super helpful. Absolutely excited to have a new member. Absolutely excited to teach, to show me everything, you know, like just from scratch. Oh my goodness. And these ladies, this group, it's not just ladies, but this group is very much involved in Fibers West, which is happening, I think, uh, the last weekend in March, second to last weekend in March. Um, and that is in Cloverdale as well. And they are going to be doing all the demonstrations of spinning and weaving. So they're gonna have a corner of the complex where they're gonna be situated and they're gonna be doing demos. So, wow, what a group to get involved with. It was just fabulous. So my spinning journey is about to start. Hasn't started yet, 
hasn't started yet, but I put my wheel together and uh, I'm going to start trying. <laughs> so we shall see what comes of that. The second really fun thing under, you know, my intention of building better practices and becoming a better knitter, I decided to, um, and this is a big leap. Oh, hello, Duke. My dog wants out. Okay, he wants out in a second. I decided to join the, I didn't join, I enrolled in the Master, Master Knitting Guild. Yes, the Master Knitting Guild of America. And what that means is it's a course. You know, you join the guild for $35 or whatever it is, but it's actually a three-level course that you take to master knitting. I don't know if I've bitten off more than I can chew because, oh my goodness, it is very, very intense. As a matter of fact, they send you prerequisite information that says if you can do this without any errors, then you're good enough a knitter to, to actually go on this three course journey, three level journey. And each level takes you a year, year and a half to do. And they start off by asking you to knit a swatch. In Cascade 220, they give you a couple of options. In Cascade 220, and your swatch, and not just your swatch, but your blocking of that swatch has to pass. And you're not sending it in at this point, you're just looking at it yourself. And I'm thinking, oh, how, how hard that can that be? I've done a ton of swatches and I've blocked all sorts of sweaters. Well, <laughs> this is my swatch. You're not gonna see too much, but this is my swatch and you're doing it on a four and a half, you know, needle gauge based on what the ball band says for the yarn. And doesn't it look pretty? It looks lovely, but two things. You also have to look at the back of your swatch. Well, the back of your swatch, you're thinking that there's nothing so bad with the back of my swatch. Well, you might not be able to see it. I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it. My swatch is basically, my tension is wrong. My tension does, I do a loose row and then two tight rows and then the loose row and then two tight pearls and then the loose pearl and then two tight pearls. And you're not allowed to do that. You're purling and your stitches on the front have to be exactly even, number one. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing, then the second thing is your blocking. Your blocking can't roll. <laughs> your blocking can't roll. These stitches are supposed to be flat and my stitches are rolling. <laughs> so. I'm, and especially your side stitches where on, on the side, they're not supposed to roll to the back like these ones do. They're supposed to lie flat to the front, flat to the, they're supposed to lie flat and mine don't. So apparently I have some work on blocking to do and I have some, a lot of work on gauge to do. So I think this is going to be a bigger nut than I thought. And, but I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about learning uh, what I need to learn and you have to knit a lot of swatches is what this whole program everything is done on a swatch So level one you have to knit a whole bunch of swatches and you end up having to do uh, a very very simplified mitten pattern With some color work and you have to design the color work yourself So this course is going to teach you not only how to master all the different skills in knitting all the knitting techniques cast-ons bind-offs everything that's out there uh, all the color work techniques, uh, all the blocking techniques, but you have to do a ton of research and you have to submit papers. Uh-huh. <laughs> so wish me luck. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. So I might do a few updates as the, the I'm not going to do too much, um, um, podcasting about that, but cause I think it's going to be quite an intensive study of knitting. But I'm excited to do it. I'm excited to be a better knitter and it certainly meets my intention uh, for building my skills, building better practices, learning new techniques. I think I cover a whole bunch of my intentions by enrolling in a course like that. So I'm just waiting for the course material and as soon as I get it, I'll get started. So hopefully I can do a few more swatches and pass the prerequisite part of it. <laughs> 
but uh, looking forward to getting underway on that. And other than that, that is all I have to share for today. And I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave whatever comments you like and I will happily try and answer them because I love the conversation that we are having around something that we're all so passionate about. Uh, and on that note, I will say goodbye for now. And I'm looking forward to spending time with you next time around. Take care and happy knitting.